Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Astrotech 115 EDT 115mm F7 Apochromatic Refractor Optical Tube Assembly. How does it look? Let's check it out. Now an apochromatic refractor is of course the holy grail for many observers who are addicted to the deep contrasty pinpoint star images given by an unobstructed optical system. It can get addicting looking at these things and for those of you who are looking at planets or the moon or double stars, a refractor is very often the best choice for such targets. This particular model is sold as an optical tube with rings, a plate, two-speed focuser, and a case. Now the, the rings, the plate, and the case itself can amount to a couple of hundred dollars, so the $1,399 asking price isn't all that bad. I can remember uh, it wasn't that long ago that you couldn't get a telescope like this at any price. In fact, for a very long time, a good apochromatic refractor was so expensive it was out of reach for average observers. But recent manufacturing cost reductions by offshore suppliers have made it so that these things have become within the reach of most observers. Now these brand labeling agreements mean that this same basic model has been available under many different nameplates. These include the Mead Series 6000 115, the StellarView SV 115, Orion had it as the Eon 115, Altair has it as a 115, and for those of you who are overseas, I believe TS Optic has the same telescope under their nameplate as well. Prices vary depending on who you buy it from and what accessories you get with it. Now, as I've said before, many observers have it as their goal to one day own a fine apochromatic refractor. But we have to be a little bit careful here. Make sure that this device is the one that's right for you. For example, many beginners, I get emails from beginners, write me and say that this is what they want. And it's because they've read a review somewhere, including some of my own, praising these things to the point where they decide, yes, this is exactly what I want to start off with. Now you can, but you really want to be aware of what kind of observer you are. Like I said before, in very general terms, apochromatic refractors are great at looking at planets, the moon, and double stars. We have a club member who spends probably 80% of his time looking at double stars, and as a result, you go to his house and you see lots of long, skinny tubes in his telescope room. But if you're looking for, say, deep sky objects, if you're looking to hunt down those little obscure galaxies in your atlas, this may not be the telescope for you. As Scotty said, you cannot defy the laws of physics. It only gathers four and a half inches worth of light, big for a refractor, but if you're looking for deep sky objects that are dim, a big reflector may be something that's better for you. Notice there aren't any right or wrong answers, there's only what works for you. This is also a good indication of how our perceptions change based on the kind of telescope that you buy. Four and a half inches, as I said, is getting to be pretty large for a refractor, but if you're talking about a Newtonian reflector, they're just getting started at four and a half inches. For example, the Orion Star Blast, that thing you see everywhere, I have one here, I think it's over my shoulder here, that's a four and a half inch Newtonian reflector, it's $199. We look at that telescope and we say, yeah, that's probably reasonably priced. But at the same time, we look at this refractor, it's four and a half inches, same aperture, we talk about it at $1,400 and we call it a bargain. <laughs> so that's how our perceptions change based on the kind of telescope that we buy. So if you wanna do deep sky with a mid-sized apochromatic refractor, you can do it up to a point. And in fact, on some objects, it actually helps you, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, a good example of this is a low contrast object like, say, M33, that's the galaxy in Triangulum. No, it doesn't look like that when you see it through the telescope. Many beginners seeing this thing plotted as a large object in their star atlas often go after it, and then they're disappointed when they can't see anything. Yes, its magnitude would suggest that it's a very bright object, but it's spread out over such a large uh, portion of the sky that it's very hard for it to stand out against the background. If you're looking at M33 through a good refractor, its superior contrast may make it stand out better than a slightly larger Newtonian. So let's get this thing up on a mount and outside, and let's take a look at it. 
And here we have the Astrotech 115 on a CG5 mount. This is a mid-size mount. I've had my doubts as to whether it would go on this, but I didn't seem to have any problems at all. The optical tube weighs somewhere around 11.2 pounds on my scale. By the time you add the rings, the finder, the diagonal, the eyepiece, you could find yourself pushing the scale somewhere around 16 pounds, but you notice even where the counterweight position is on the shaft, you still got a ways to go. I don't have any problems at all, either visually or photographically. Star test on this one, very good. Perhaps a trace of undercorrection somewhere on the order of just a little bit less than a quarter of a wave, looking at the diagrams in Suter's book. Nothing really to worry about. I used to be really concerned about all this stuff, but you know, star testing is a fun thing to do for telescopes. When things are in focus, it's very, very difficult to tell when things get this good. It's a triplet, so there is very little false color. I just kept pumping up the power on bright stars. I couldn't see any false color to speak of. Planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars near opposition right now uh, look really clear and sharp. It's exactly what you want to see from a refractor. In addition to the aluminum case, it comes with rings and a plate. Now the, the stock rings and plate that came with this telescope have temporarily gone missing, but that's okay because you can make your own. The tube diameter is somewhere around 115 millimeters, which is convenient because there are a number of manufacturers that make rings in diameters of 114, 115, or 116 millimeters, depending on where you buy them. Now, I think they're pretty much all the same. These are the 116 millimeter rings from Orion. They're about $40. It's a really cheap way to get out of this. And in fact, these are the rings that I use on my Takahashi FS-102. These rings are a convenient size because that 115 millimeter give or take diameter is used by certain Japanese manufacturers on their four inch refractors, noticeably uh, Vixen and Takahashi. And let's do a quick walk around. Handsome telescope as refractors tend to be. Works well on a mid-size mount like this AVX. And there's multi-coated lens, looks good. Non-collimatable lens cell. I have friends who joke that they have more fun looking down this end of the telescope than they do the other end. Those are just beautiful lenses. They're joking, of course. Uh, I'm not sure how much <laughs> they're actually joking about that. Nice two-speed focuser here. There's the fine focus. I've got a red dot finder on there now. Those are not the stock rings. Those are ones that I made. That is my astrophysics diagonal and teleview eyepiece. And again, a really well-made scope. Not much to talk about. That is almost always a good sign. Hello, and we're back after several nights of observing and the news, it's all good. True to form, I spent most of my time looking at the planets Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, which is near opposition right now. I split some double stars, Eta Cass, Albireo, and Delta Cygnus. None of these are especially difficult for a four inch class telescope, but the view is very pleasing nonetheless. As for deep sky, I hit most of the showpiece objects, the ring, the dumbbell, the double cluster, M13, M92, M33, M31, and later in the evening, the three clusters in Auriga, M37, M36, and M38. It does the refractor thing, the deep, dark, rich background and pinpoint stars in the foreground looking like diamonds on velvet. So not much to report here. It's just a lot of fun and it's a terrific telescope for the money. Now, I did spend some time comparing the AT-115 with this, my Takahashi FS-102. Now, the FS-102 is, of course, a standard in our industry in this class of telescope and a known quantity. I set them up on identical mounts side by side and look through them one after another. I had a club member ask me, could you tell the difference between the apertures? I mean, four inch versus four and a half inch. And I have to say, Yes, I could. This is a little bit brighter. It's not an earth-shattering difference, but it is a little bit brighter. Uh, but I found I'd really have to look for it to notice it. I was going back and forth between the telescopes so much that I actually kind of lost track in the dark. Wait, which one is this again? Is this the TAC or is this the Astrotech? So they're pretty close in that regard. 
Focal lengths are almost identical at somewhere around 800 millimeters. And you'll notice the Takahashi, despite being a smaller aperture telescope, is actually bigger than the, the, than the AstroTech, which has more aperture. Both of them use the same 114 to 115 di millimeter diameter tube. Uh, Takahashi oversizes everything and their build quality tends to be bulletproof and tank-like. It's just the way they do things. Other than that, how do they compare? Well, it's pretty darn close. Optically, this one has a better star test than the AT-115, although this one is not bad by any means, and in focus, you can't really tell. Mechanical construction, this one does have collimatable lens cell, which this doesn't, but this has a rotating two-speed focuser, and it's a two-inch focuser. Now, you can get all of those things with a Takahashi, but you have to pay for every one of those things I just mentioned, and if you've ever priced Tak accessories, uh, some of those prices can be quite breathtaking. Now, for photography, you do need a field flattener. And this is one that says AstroTech on it. I think it's just a generic field flattener that they have uh, their name on here. Uh, and it's okay. It's only about $125, uh, very inexpensive for a field flattener, and it works pretty good. Um, if you look, it will not um, fully cover the frame of a 35 millimeter sensor. Uh, if you look at the, at the corner here, the image of M31, look at the corners, see how they're vignetted. You don't get full coverage with this field flattener. But again, for the money, really can't complain. The Takahashi field flattener, for, uh, in contrast, is an amazingly beautiful and seriously heavy hunk of glass. Uh, it costs somewhere around $600. I don't think you can get that anymore. The new field flattener for the new FC100DC uh, has a breathtaking price. Wow. So again, the FS102's field flattener is also a reducer. It takes it down to F6, which helps your astrophotography, and it also fully covers the frame of the full-frame 35 millimeter sensor. But in any case, let's take a look at some images that I took through this AstroTech. So there you have it, an incredible bargain in a four and a half inch class aperchromatic refractor. Hard to believe you couldn't even get something like this about a generation ago, let alone for only $1,399. Just make sure it's right for you. If you're into hunting really dim, small, deep space objects, perhaps a larger Newtonian reflector would be the telescope for you. Now the analogy I like to make with this is with audio. I love fine audio. And there are people who will spend an enormous amount of money on these tiny little mini monitor speakers, uh, five to $10,000 for a pair of very small speakers that need dedicated stands is not unusual. Now, a layman looking at this situation may ask, why would you spend so much money on a pair of speakers that have no bass? Uh, the owner of the speakers has made a conscious decision that yes, I'm giving up the bass but anything above that level is near perfection. And you have a similar case here. You're giving up light gathering ability. Those first three or four inches of aperture are near perfection, and you're willing to give up that last bit of aperture gathering capability to get that. So it's not a matter of anybody being right or wrong. It's more a matter of your priorities. If your priorities are in line with what a refractor does, I give this a hearty recommendation. Let us know how you're doing. Do you have one of these? Let us know how those work out for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.